all here at GopherCon because we care about great engineering. Great engineering is not only about solving problems, but it's also about being good at communicating the solution. By the end of this talk, I hope that you'll appreciate the role that testing plays in communicating that intent. Once again, my name is Alan Braithwaite. I currently work at Segment, and I've been using Go for about five years to build data systems, which I've used to inform this talk. So how many of you, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands again, have uh, come to a new project, open source or proprietary, for work or for fun, uh, cloned it, downloaded it, got it building and everything, only to discover that when you started development, there weren't any tests? How many of you have? OK. Yeah, so all the rest of you whose hands are down, I'm very skeptical. <laughs> I've definitely downloaded multiple projects that don't have any tests. But that's beside the point. The point is, what can you tell about a program that doesn't have any tests? You can tell that it executes the instructions that it's giving to the CPU, but what else? Can you really be sure that a program without tests like, can you know what the programmer intended it to do? Tests are the means to communicate the intent of the program to other engineers and possibly, and importantly, even future you. So why test at all? To reiterate, we test to communicate the intent of the program. We also test to verify that the program is doing what you expect. And along the way, we happen to discover bugs. These bugs are the unexpected behavior of the program. Now, before we begin and dive into the talk, I want to say that engineering is fundamentally about trade-offs and understanding what those trade-offs entail. So throughout this talk, take nothing here as prescriptive and, and consider instead consider what works best in the context of your project, your code, and your organization. Finally, if tests aren't making your work easier, then you should really rethink and reconsider your testing strategy. So over the next 20 or so minutes, we're going to be covering how to best structure your code to make it testable, how to write effective test suites using Go, and finally, a little bit of a fun one, the last HTTP test I hope you'll ever have to write. What we're not covering in this talk is the tooling. So GoVet, GoLint, we're not covering test coverage. We're not doing race detection or testing frameworks. These are all very important, of course. I encourage you to go do some research on your own if you haven't learned about any of these. But it's not really important to the topic of this talk. So first, let's talk about how to structure your code such that it's more testable. We're first going to talk a little bit about dependency injection. Then we're going to talk about how channels and tests interact. And finally, we're going to talk about how interfaces and tests work together. So firstly, what is dependency injection? Dependency injection is a design pattern that allows you to inject your dependencies into a constructor. So what that means is you have your struct or your package, and you need some external dependency you're able to fulfill that dependency by allowing whoever is calling that to input their own implementation. So let's take a look at an example. So here we have a service which talks to a SQL database and various ways to initialize it. I chose SQL here specifically because it is so nuanced. There is no such thing as a perfect abstraction, particularly when it comes to SQL. There are many different SQL implementations, and they all have their own features. And because of that, you can't write the exact same code to interact with these databases. So in the first example, you can see that we're only injecting the database connection string. Here, it is useful to notice that we instantiate the actual database connection using the driver that we specify, in this case, Postgres. So this might be useful when 
you want to enforce the fact that you're using Postgres, for example, when you're using features that are specific to Postgres. If you're using features specific to MySQL, you might do the same here. In the second example, we're accepting a generic SQL database. This might be useful if you are migrating between two different SQL-like databases, or if you want to be able to test locally with, say, a SQLite database, and you're running Postgres or MySQL in production. So those two vary in a slight way. However, the last one, it's the fully abstracted example where we've defined a completely new interface called store here, which doesn't imply any sort of database at all. Now, this last example might be useful for you to be able to stub out tests or if you can actually satisfy that dependency using other database types like a key value store. However, you lose the ability to enforce certain uh, the constraints on that database. So hopefully this illustrates the different levels of dependency injection and which one works for you is really dependent on your environment and your program. But what if you want to be able to override behavior without using dependency injection? There are other ways to do that. So anybody who's tested time knows without a doubt that it's probably one of the hardest things to verify. Aside from the formatting issues that you might have with strings, you also have to deal with the current time frequently. So here we've defined a global variable in our package which we're able to override. We're calling calc expiry here to calculate the future expiration date of a current given a duration. However, in our test, that's hard to verify if we don't have the current time because in our function, it calls time.now. So in our test, what we can do is first we save the reference to time.now, and then we can restore that reference later in case any other tests depend on that. Finally, we override time.now, or our now function in expiration.go, with a well-known date that we can actually use to be able to validate and check our tests. This is a good example where you don't need dependency injection to be able to override the behavior of your program in your tests, and that might be desirable when you don't want to provide the ability to override it to the consumer of your API or to whatever is using this particular, particular piece of code. All right. Now let's talk a little bit about channels. Channels obviously are one of the most powerful tools in Go. However, I'm going to argue that it's much easier to test an API, which is synchronous, that is, it doesn't export channels, than it is to test an API that does export channels. When thinking about channels, you have to consider all of this context when testing them. There's a lot of channel semantics that you have to keep in your head that imply that it's a lot of cognitive overhead to keep track of when you're writing the test. <laughs> Things like who owns the channel? Who, what is the life cycle of this channel? Who closes it? Is it buffered or unbuffered? Because those have different semantics. How do we handle errors? All of these are examples of things that you have to think about. During the research for this talk, I found only four examples in the standard library that exported channels with like a meaningful, in a meaningful way, that is not reflect in runtime. So those were net and HTTP for cancellation, signal for notifications, and time, which is notifications, but it also has a data component that is the time object. So these are very simple APIs. They're well-defined, well-documented, and it's a good example of the exception to this rule. But in general, I think you should try and avoid using channels, exporting channels from your library. So let's take a look at an example. So here we have a QLib. It has a reader struct, and it has this method called readchan, which returns a channel of some type message. In our test, when we want to test this, 
We instantiate the new reader, and you might start by just ranging over the read chan and verifying each message individually. However, you have to consider always how do you handle those errors. Almost certainly there will be some sort of error handling code that you need to do when dealing with a queue of this type. So you start to, you add this, you convert your loop into a loop with a select statement inside, and you read from both channels, but all of a sudden now you don't really know where this error occurred, and your library has to get more complicated to communicate back to the user how this error occurred, et cetera. Additionally, you have to deal with timeouts. Uh, you've still got reading semantics and all of that. So it frequently, uh, it quickly gets out of control, especially for the library maintainer. Conversely, if you write your test in a synchronous way, I think it communicates the intent much better and you don't have to worry about all of those additional semantics. So here we have the same API written in a synchronous manner and this is how your test would look as a result. So read message, it is a blocking function here. Uh, you could also pass in a context to this API so that it's cancelable. But what's important to notice is just because this method is a blocking method doesn't mean that the implementation can't be asynchronous under the hood. So this could block until it receives a message and then you'll be fine. However, I'd like to propose a question. Would you rather test this code or code that exports channels? I almost always fall on this code instead. And I'll have another example of this later. A very perhaps contentious topic in Go is how best to use interfaces. Interfaces are another one of the most powerful features of Go. However, it's oftentimes confusing, especially for people coming from other languages, when it's best, most appropriate to use them. So I'm gonna argue that library authors should not export interfaces unless they have a very strong, compelling reason to do so. Conversely, I think program authors should create internal interfaces to express and implement their external dependencies so that they are free to be able to implement their own stubs and define exactly what they depend on in that external dependency. So I've picked uh, a specific library here, which is very dear to my heart because I've been using it for a long time. And I picked it not to throw shade at it. It is an example of what I think is not idiomatic, but it is also a very useful package. That package is Sarama. So for those of you unfamiliar, Sarama is a Go, Go package which is a client library for Kafka. Here we can see we're scrolling through the API, which is very large, but in particular, it exports 22 unique interfaces. It provides a special mox package to satisfy the interfaces specifically for testing, but these interfaces have a very tight coupling to Kafka's implementation. So I asked myself, what are we actually testing when we are using this? So I think we are testing our calls to the Sarama library, that the mock implementation actually satisfies the interface. We're testing our code that depends on Sarama, but without running Kafka itself, which is arguably the biggest reason why you would want to use these mocks. However, we're not actually testing the behavior of the library itself because it excludes the implementation that's actually t talking to Kafka. So if you compare the actual amount of code that's being tested in the Sarama library, it's very different. But finally, it's very fragile when library authors export interfaces because they're impossible to change after you've exported them. When you add another method to an interface, it breaks all of those who depend on you. And that's not a very easy way to do your tests. So let's look at an example again. This is how I chose to solve the problem of testing this queue, or testing Sarama. What we did is we created this new message struct with some generic uh, key value, which is byte string, 
and then a topic, or a byte slice, and then a topic, which is a string, which is where the topic, the topic that the message came from. And then some additional metadata that's not as important for this talk. And then we defined a consumer and producer interface, which has, the consumer interface has a receive method, which is blocking. It accepts the context so you can cancel it and do timeouts. And then it returns that message, an act func, and an error. Likewise, the producer is also synchronous. It has a send method. It accepts a context, the act func, so you can act upstream, and a list of messages, and returns an error. This helps us because we're able to better understand what it is that we're trying to test, and we can have multiple implementations for different things. So in particular, we can stub out the entire library, and we don't have to worry about having to connect to Kafka if we don't need to, but without the huge interface that Sarama prov provides, which is also specific to Kafka. Additionally, at Segment, we've historically used NSQ a lot, but we have moved pretty much everything over to Kafka, and this interface was pretty critical in enabling that move because we needed to be sure that the behaviors of our programs interacted, that interacted with queues were the same no matter what. So there's no confusion about what's happening here, and it solves the problem of testability. So this works because now the consumers, your programs, are defining it is, what it is exactly that they depend on. So consumers can implement their own stubs. If you're a library maintainer, it greatly reduces the complexity of maintaining that library because now you don't have to worry about it. And one thing that I really like is it helps debugability. When you go to a definition for that particular method that you're currently looking at, it goes directly to the implementation instead of going through some other interface. Finally, don't take my word for it. Uh, people much smarter than me have written about this. So JBD or Rakil has a great post on this from way back in 2014. And Bill Kennedy as well has talked about this in his blog. And I think it's a really important thing that enables easier tes testing of your own code. All right. So let's talk about parameterized test suites. So I wasn't really sure what to name this section. Uh, I tried doing some research and figuring out what to call this, but we'll just run with it. If you have a better name, please come see me after the talk. I'd love to hear it. But basically, a testing strategy that I use is I start with a single implementation, I test it, Eventually, I'll find a need to abstract away that implementation. And then I'll write new implementations to satisfy that interface. Oftentimes, it may be a stub. Sometimes, it may be another implementation. And then I'll refactor my test to use that new interface. And that last step is the important one here. So let's look at an example again. We start out with a single implementation. This is a cache that uses Redis as a backend. It has two methods, get and set. And importantly, we're just calling directly into the Redis library to access those methods. Pretty simple. When we want to test this, we simply instantiate a new cache. We pass in the Redis initializer. And we test directly against Redis. Now, notice that this requires spinning up a Redis somewhere Docker is a very good tool for this, so you might want to use Docker, but if you don't have Docker, then you have to run it locally and manage that some other way. I think this is the best way to start with any project and any testing. However, you'll probably eventually get to a point where you need to build an abstraction on top of this. Like I said, whether it's stubs or a different implementation, eventually you'll want to do something like this. So what we have is we've written a store interface with two methods that are the same methods that we had on the original struct, but now we can actually implement a different implementation. So this is pretty simple. Get now, instead of calling Redis directly, calls the store interface. Set now also calls the store interface. 
and returns the same errors, same signature. Now we can use a memcache implementation. And here we've implemented memcache using that satisfies the same interface. So we have two implementations, and we want to refactor the tests. So here is how the test looks refactored. We have test cache Redis, test cache memcache, and all they're doing is they're instantiating that cache object or that cache struct and populating it with the particular implementation of the interface that we care about. And then our sweet cache function actually is the same methods as the original test Redis. And what this gets for us is this enables us to be able to write one test that can satisfy all the implementations that we've written. So why might we do this? In particular, we write less code. And who doesn't like writing less code? Um, but also, it enables us to be confident in the behavior of your program when switching implementations. If you have good coverage over the actual test API, then I'll argue that that's actually good enough for your tests. Finally, it defines the behavior in crystal clear terms. And what that does is that communicates the intent of that particular package without a doubt. So let's get to the fun part. I'm going to talk about the last HTTP server test that you'll ever need. So I can't take credit for this. Uh, Florin from JetBrains, I saw him give a talk two years ago at GopherCon, well, the pre-party, and I was just blown away by this. Um, so we're going to walk through kind of my process in bringing up this test. So when I was new, this is how I'd implement a HTTP server. I would just return a serve mux, which implements the server interface. And we instantiate it. We register two handlers. These are just returning nonsense byte strings, and they accept different methods. So this is how we might test it, given that. So to test the handlers, we might kick off a Go routine, do a listen and serve, on an unprivileged port and pass in our new server as the server. Then we would run through each URL and verify that it returns the response that we expect given the particular method that we pass it. Pretty simple, but notice that we're calling HTTP get and HTTP uh, post on those messages. I don't think I included the post here, but. In any case, let me introduce the HTTP test package. This is a package that, if you're familiar with Go and you've been using it for a while, you probably know about this package. But I think it's one of the most useful testing packages in Go because it allows you to be able to test the same servers without having to spin up and bind that port. So notice this Go routine has an infinite lifetime for the duration of the test binary, which means that no other test is going to be able to bind to that particular port, which is problematic. So the HTTP test package alleviates that need by providing methods to create a new request and also to create a new response writer, which is the HTTP, rec the new recorder method. So when you pass those into your serve HTTP method, it actually populates the response, and you can use that to verify in your tests and run your assertions. So that's pretty great. But you might say, like, oh, that's not super idiomatic. Like, of course, we should use table-driven testing. Um, so here we've created a very short table-driven test because, honestly, we don't have that much room on the slide. And what it does is it has a name, a method, and a URL, which are all strings. Then we have an expected body that we expect to get in the response and expected code for the response. We can then, in the server, instantiate a new server, which lives for the duration of the tests, and range over each of our tests, creating a new subtest for each test case. As you add test cases, it becomes very easy to generate workflows for your HTTP API. Once again, though, you'll notice that this has a major shortcoming, and that is dealing with state. This 
The way this is structured right now, it assumes no state on the HTTP server. And in many applications, if not most applications, that's simply not the case. So we can handle that. So for simple things like sessions, we can simply instantiate a cookie jar. So a cookie jar, if for those unfamiliar, HTTP cookies are how you manage sessions in uh, browser-based authentication means. So we instantiate the cookie jar, and before each request, we take every cookie in the cookie jar and we add it to a request. And then after we get the response, if it has any set cookie headers, we can set the cookies on the cookie jar so that the next request actually has the state necessary to be able to communicate that you're authenticated, what have you. So that's good enough for login, but what about for database-driven applications where the state is held in the database? So this is not Go code, but this is a particular feature of Docker that I really enjoy. So this is a Postgres Docker file from the standard library for Docker. And what it has in it is this special directory called docker entry point initdb.d. So MySQL, Postgres, and a bunch of other SQL-like databases definitely implement this. Some other databases might, I'm not entirely sure. But what this allows you to do is when you copy in all those SQL scripts into that directory, it'll actually run those. So you have the schema that you expect inside the database. So you can actually exercise your entire test suite locally, which I think is amazing. The one thing that you do have to worry about is clearing that state afterwards. So we'll instantiate the new database, and then we'll create, pass that database into the new server using dependency injection. And then we run our tests as we would normally, using the table-driven testing. So now you can do workflows like creating accounts, creating objects in your database. Doesn't matter. But at the very end, you have to make sure to truncate your tables or somehow clean up to a point that it's usable for the next test. So using all those techniques, I think you can see how you can create a pattern where you just use that for every HTTP test, and then you don't have to think about how to test an HTTP server ever again. So to wrap up, just remember that testing is more about communication than anything else. It should more than ever be about making writing code easier and if it's not doing that, once again, think about how you're doing your testing. And finally, always consider your testing strategies in the context of your program, your organization, because without that, you won't be able to really effectively test your code. Thank you. <laughs>